Hey everybody, my name is Jim Farmer. I'm the festival director of Out on Film, Atlanta's LGBTQ Film Festival. Out on Film and the um, Swiss Consulate are presenting a very special screening on June 14th of a phenomenal documentary called Madame. And I am very lucky today to have the director of the film with us, Stefan Riethauser. Um, thank you, Stefan. We're very, very excited about showing the film. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for having my film and having me today. Absolutely. We're very excited about showing the film and I'm very excited about to talk to you as well. Um, I, I mentioned to you a little bit earlier, I watched the film a while ago and I watched it again this morning to, to better prepare myself for the interview. But you know, one of the things I, I noticed is that you know, this is a very personal documentary. I, I was just wondering, of the films you make, are your films always this personal or, or is this your most personal film? Well, this one is particularly personal yeah. uh, because uh, it portrays my grandmother, yeah. it shows my family, and it's made with uh, family archive footage. Yeah. So it is very personal. Um, I wanted to do something authentic and personal and intimate to try to move people and to share my story because I think I had something to say and the, the pattern that I recognize in my family story sure. uh, could resonate in some other families and some other individuals also. And that's the testimonies actually I've received. Uh, I've shown the film uh, quite a few times now around the world uh, in various countries and continents and the feedback touched and say to me, this could be me. Or uh, uh, I have a different specific story, but the pattern is the same. I had against uh, a structure that was uh, putting me in prison, in some kind of prison I had to set free in order to live a free life. And my grandmother had to do that as a woman uh, more than a century ago. Actually, it was in the early 1920s. It was 100 yeah. years ago. Um, she had to go against patriarchy, against uh, uh, an authoritarian dad uh, in order to set free. She was forced to be married when she was 15 uh, to a guy that she didn't even love that was older uh, than her. Uh, she was forced into sexual relations. Uh, within this marriage, uh, she had her first baby when she was 18 and then she divorced and she was repudiated by yeah. her family. And then my... Uh, life story is a little bit different. Thanks to her successes in life, I could grow up in a very nurturing environment, very privileged environment. I was a boy. I grew up in Switzerland, uh, you know, on the uh, Lake Geneva shore, very protected. Everything, the, the world was made for me, was waiting for me, except all of a sudden I realized, uh, uh, or progressively I realized I was different, I was gay. And I kind of was risking losing all these privileges. And I had to set free and I only became aware of that much later in my life. I had to fight the same patriarchal structures that my grandmother did in order to be a free man also. Exactly. I wanna read a quick description of the films. I didn't do that when we opened, but in the film, Madame, um, Carolyn, a 90 year old grandmother and her gay grandson Stefan explore the development and transmission of a gender identity in a patriarchal environment. It's an astonishing documentary that, as you mentioned, has played all around the world. And I'm very, very excited because this is going to be the first time it's played in Atlanta. So we're very, very excited yes. about showing the film. Thank you for that. So when, when was it that you decided that you wanted to make this film? Well, it's funny because I started recording my grandmother with a very cheap audio microphone mm -hmm. in the late 90s. Um, she was turning 90 yeah. and I was afraid that she would leave this world uh, without transmitting all of her stories to the further generations. I was mm -hmm. thinking about my little nephew that wasn't even born back then, but I mean, I don't have kids, but maybe, you know, to keep that in the family archive. Sure. It was just a private matter. And her stories were um, so fascinating and her personality is so flamboyant and she was so funny that later after the audio recording, I started to film her also in her daily life, in her bedroom, in her kitchen, in her living room and interviewing her again. And to tell you the truth, I had no intention of making a film, maybe something private one day for the family. 
And then life went on. Um, she uh, left us, she died in 2004, just when I was starting to work for uh, Swiss television. And I became a television director. And then mm -hmm. I moved to Berlin a couple of years later and I started to do independent cinema. And between two projects, I looked at these old tapes that were 10 years old back then. And I was stunned and I was like, wow, there's actually some material I recognize now with the distance that could tell uh, something about the condition of women. And this was my initial idea to tell the story of this lady that was my grandmother uh, that could maybe teach something to other people about what women were uh, had to, to go through back then. And to tell you a funny anecdote, that was my initial uh, idea. Then I was like, that's not enough, just a biography of one person. Then I had the brilliant idea to include her maid that uh, we see a little bit at the end of the film, this Sri Lankan lady that has been her maid for more than 20 years. I was like, oh, I have different point of, points of view. Fantastic. This could be a nice double portrait sure. of two, two women. And I showed the first version of the uh, editing to a good friend of mine who is always my fiercest uh, critic. <laughs> and this friend, she said to me, okay, your grandma, she's amazing. Uh, this Sri Lankan lady, she's interesting, but maybe not interesting enough. Exactly. What is your point of view? What's your story? What's your relationship to your grandmother? You're not taking any risks here. You're not saying anything about yourself. If you want to say something about women, then maybe you need to say something about men also and about gender in general, about your specific relationship to your grandmother. You as a gay grandson, you probably have a lot to say. And then it sort of clicked in my head. I was like, of course, um, I need to put myself into the film which was not the initial idea. Okay. And then I sort of edited the, the, the poor Sri Lankan uh, lady made out of the film and I put me as a character instead. And indeed, there's a, there's a tension there also between the grandmother and her grandson um, that could maybe be more relevant um, than the, just a simple double portrait of two ladies. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I noticed, you know, immediately when I watched this film, um, your grandmother is a great storyteller. Your grandmother is very, very funny. <laughs> yes, she is. And you can tell, you can tell there's such a loving bond between you two. When you, I mean, and there's a lot that she talks about that she had to go through in her life. Did you, did you know about all these things or do you have to find out these things as you were talking to her for this? I found out uh, these things yeah. as I was talking to her and actually, Interestingly enough, um, it is when she found out about my being gay mm -hmm. that uh, then I opened up to her that she opened up to me. Yeah. And at first, like uh, we see in the film, uh, she was a little bit shaken, but then very, very quickly, she opened up and said, I love you the way you are. And the bond, the special bond we had became even deeper and stronger. And she had the feeling she had an ally. She had an, also an artist, somebody that was not like everybody else in the family or, or in her uh, circle of friends. And her grandson, I was always special to her. She told me, I felt it. But then this made us special because we were, both of us, each in, in his and her own way, the black sheep of the family somehow. And I think it made us uh, bond even stronger. Nice. It took a lot of strength on her part to get through a lot of what she had to go through. Yes, yes. She was a strong character. And I must say, I, I think I think about her all the time when I'm facing an obstacle in my professional life or in my private life. It's like, listen, grandma went through so much and you lead a privileged life. Don't forget this. Uh, back then, 100 years ago, she had nothing. She mm -hmm. had no role models. She had, she had no access to education. She had no access to, to uh, health care. Uh, she had nothing that could help her. She was uh, on her own, basically, with no family support. And she started working as a hairdresser when she was 15, 16. 
And then she was just talented. She had a passion for life, for people. She loved people. She wanted to be surrounded by people all the time. And she always had jobs where this could be um, materializing. And um, then she became a saleswoman for corsets. And then uh, she uh, had her first car, uh, which was unheard of at the time. Uh, she says in the film that she got the second driver's license ever given to a woman in Geneva, Switzerland. And um, then she went on with antique shops and restaurants and everything. And she became a successful businesswoman all on her own. We could almost say the American way, you know, the American dream. Where, but this happened in Switzerland. Uh, and this was the daughter of a very poor Italian immigrant family. Can you, obviously, you dealt with your own issues as you were growing up, you know, trying to become comfortable in your own skin. I, I, there, there's a scene in which, you know, you, you talk about you associated at a young age, you associated being gay, you know, with shame. Can, can you talk a little bit about overcoming that and, and the process it took for you finally to feel comfortable in your skin and, and being a gay man? It was a very painful and very long process, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Um, I grew up in a privileged environment. Like I said before, everything was in place. Uh, I had a nice family, nuclear family, mom, dad. I was the elder brother, younger brother. We were two boys. And what I learned at a very early age is boys do these things, girls do other things. Sure. Uh, love is between boys and girls friendship is between boys or between girls sometimes between a boy and a girl but it doesn't really exist and certain professions activities were for boys i i i was taught that gender matters uh regarding to your education uh girls don't need to go to the army uh, in switzerland army is still mandatory every boy needs to go at the age of 19. And that's what I had to do also later in life. I was always taught, be a man. And, which I didn't know in theory at the time, but I felt it in my, in my skin, in my sure. flesh, that you had to prove that you're a boy or a man or a real man every single day of your life in order to be socially accepted mm -hmm. uh, by your peers, uh, by your uh, religious community, sports team, uh, classmates, whatever it is, um, you have to prove that uh, rel relentlessly. And proving it meant uh, playing the tough guy and disregarding women and homosexuals, which are basically put in the same basket. Exactly. Uh, I am a man because I am no woman, I am no sissy, I am no faggot to put it that way. And this I didn't know in theory, but it was really, I felt it. And you feel the adult world, you feel society around you, reminding you that you need to behave a certain way. So I integrated those rules and I tried the best I could. I wanted to be integrated. I wanted to be the best little boy in the world. I wanted to be a good son, a good grandson. I wanted to be uh, good in, in, at school and everything. And I felt that I had a fab for boys. Uh, mm -hmm. I looked at them differently. I fell in love. I had crushes and everything, but I didn't really intellectually understand this. I could not conceive it in my head. I knew it was bad, but there was no way out from this. And it took me gradually a, a long time to slowly understand that yes, maybe I could be gay, but if I am, this needs to remain my secret until the day I die, because otherwise I'm gonna be killed socially. Exactly. And I have a lot to, uh, I'm very grateful um, to America because America was the land of freedom and justice for all. And uh, America actually saved me because I had the opportunity to go study there after I graduated from high school um, in, a, in a college in Connecticut. And this is only very far away from home, 5,000 miles away from Europe, that um, I had my first gay encounter 
Um, I um, tell about it in the film also. Yes. And uh, I was still feeling very guilty and shameful, but still the attraction was stronger. And um, this boy confronted me after a little affair. And I was like, no, no, this, this can't happen again. And she was like, he was like, look at yourself in the mirror, Stefan. Uh, come on, you're gay. And I could not accept this fact. But then it is also through movies and books, those two uh, cultural um, items, so to say, that I could have uh, reflections and mirrors, um, role models, identification processes that could help me slowly shape a new me. And I have a lot to thank uh, to, to uh, I'm very grateful, yes, to America, to the English language, who gave me another structure to think uh, different, uh, different uh, frames and uh, films and books um, that, that were also very, very helpful. Nice. How influential was it going to your first New York Gay Pride event? Well, it was a, a very, very big emotion because um, as, you, as you saw in the film, my very first Gay Pride uh, in New York was 1987. Mm -hmm. But I was there as a 15-year-old boy uh, with my parents and my brother. And I happened to have our first video camera um, and I was filming the Gay Pride Parade in 87. And I didn't know what I was looking at. It was the first time I saw gay, queer, lesbians uh, yeah. on the street and they were dressed in a funny way, but they were smiling, they were dancing. And it was also one of the first times I was confronted with the word AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, and there were, there were uh, banners and they were angry at Ronald Reagan. I remember asking my mom, but why don't they like Ronald Reagan? And she couldn't really answer me and because Ronald Reagan was the American president and he was our ally as Europeans and he was yeah. our friends. And I thought he was a good guy against the, the evil Russians. Uh, that was the limits of my political spectrum back then. But then there's a funny thing also, I didn't know it of course at the time, I don't know if you recognized her, but there is one shot in the film from 87 that actually uh, closes up on Marsha P. Johnson. Okay. And she was marching oh, and wow. all of a sudden there's this creature and she waves at me and smiles at me. Oh, and I was like, oh, well, this is a funny creature here. And it's only years later, to tell you the truth, even after I finished the editing of the film, Mm -hmm. that I saw a documentary on Marsha P. Johnson. I knew she, who she was, but I couldn't recall her face or anything. But for the anecdote, I watched the Netflix documentary three months after the film came out. And I was like, oh my God, Marsha P. Johnson is in my own film. I filmed her in 87. That, so is, that was my that first gay pride parade in 87. Good. And the second one or the first one as an out and proud gay man, that was 90... Um, 1997 okay. in New York on Fifth Avenue. And I was working back then for GLSEN, the Gay, Lesbian and Straight Education Network. Mm -hmm. um, I was the assistant to Kevin Jennings. I was working in New York. I was living my gay life um, and one of the best times ever in my life. That's great. So your father found out that you were gay before you officially told your grandmother. Can you talk a little bit about your father's reaction? I told my parents, I told them in the face. And uh, my father was completely shocked. He could not believe it. He called me names. Uh, he said, I didn't know, I had no experience. It was unnatural. The, all the cliches you could think of were concentrated in one conversation. My mom started to cry, asked me if I wanted to go see a shrink. I was like, no, maybe you need to, but I'm fine now. Finally, I'm fine. Um, I know what I'm talking about. And from now on, I'm gonna educate you on this matter because I know a lot more than you do. So I'm ready to answer all the questions you have. Mm -hmm. I told my parents. First question of my dad was, so do you play the man or the woman? <laughs> I was like, babe, wrong question. It's two men. Yeah. And it started like that. Uh, my dad, I felt it. Um, he, he never really acknowledged it, but I know that he fell into some kind of depression. 
because his entire construction of his male identity fell apart. And I'm referring to what I was saying before. For him, a real man is only a man in so far that he's not a woman and not behaving like a woman and no sissy and not crying and a strong guy and, and also having sexual relationships with women, dominating women. Mm. And I mean by that very concretely, you need to fuck women and not get fucked. Otherwise, you're not a real man. And this image is very strong, I think, for every father of a gay son. They have trouble with that because it's always associated with some kind of weakness. But why is it a weakness? Because it's associated with a behavior that only women engage in. Mm -hmm. And we need to educate people now and say, no, not only women do that. Also, men are being penetrated and enjoy it and vice versa. And even straight men enjoy that too. And it doesn't make them gay. And I have a lot of testimonies now from my straight friends also discovering the joy of anal sex and with their girlfriends. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm 45 years old. I didn't know it existed. I'm like, well, welcome to the club, darling. You know? Yeah. So I think it's very important that sexuality is still a big taboo. Yeah. And, and these social constructions of what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a man, need to be destroyed and replaced just not completely destroyed, but maybe enlarged. Uh, maybe we need to see a broader picture. And exactly. if we can be more inclusive, and, and you know, if the, the to, to, to take cliches once again, but the, the, little, the little girl that wants to play football or soccer or basketball yeah. and has short hair, she's immediately called a tomboy. No, can't she just be a girl that likes playing basketball? Same for uh, the, the gracious, delicate little boy that wants to do ballet, you know, the typical. And so if we have a broader understanding of gender, then we can expand our consciousness and, and our understanding of the other. And I think we can live in a better world, in a better society where everybody accepts uh, each other. And exactly. I think that's the bottom line, maybe, and that's that's a key idea in, in this film, is that sexism uh, and gender bias is deeply linked to homophobia. Mm -hmm. Or better said, the opposite. Homophobia is the product of a narrow-minded gender uh, understanding of gender. And if we broaden this, I think if, if women were not discriminated so much, if this male dominated world uh, would, would change, then homophobia would disappear by itself. Almost. Exactly. Yeah. In the film, you, you eventually do tell your grandmother and it seems like there's a little bit of awkwardness, but then she's fine with it. She supports you. She even tries to set you up on a date. I mean, can you talk about, you know, what happened after you told your grandmother and the bond that formed? Because as you mentioned earlier, it, it did sort of um, liberate you and it liberated her in terms of confiding in each other and talking more honestly. With each other. Just talk about what happened after you told your grandmother. Well, I was actually in Spain studying, uh, studying mm -hmm. back then in Madrid. Um, but when I came back to Switzerland, she knew. I started to go... Um, visit her for lunch on a regular basis. And we became a lot closer. Like I mentioned before, yeah. uh, she opened up and started telling me all these stories. Like, well, grandma, I had no idea that you went through so much suffering also. Yeah. She was telling me about the, the dark sides also of her education, of her family life, of her first marriage, sometimes not finishing her sentences. And this is when I got the idea to, to record her uh, because she was, she was you know, she was 90 years old back then. She, she uh, went on to live uh, until she was 95, ultimately. Mm -hmm. And those last five years, um, it was actually a little bit more because I came out, it was to her 96 and she died 2004. Mm -hmm. And I remember also, um, after I came out to my family and to my friends, um, the only remaining person I was not out to was my grandmother. And everybody was telling me in my entourage, 
better not tell her. You'd rather not tell her. She's too old. She's already 85. You're going to kill her. That's going to kill her. She's not going to take it too much. Leave her alone. Why would you do that to her? And I was like, should I lie to my own grandmother that I love so much? Until the day she dies, she won't know the truth about me. This was an unbearable thought in the situation, actually. And it went on for, for two years. Then, like I said, it was away. It was in Madrid. She finally found out, like I say in the film. Yeah. And then imagine we have another eight years of joy and truthful relationship. Um, she opened up. We had so much fun together. And we recorded those video cassettes uh, back then. Um, she, she's a good comedian, as you mentioned. She's, yes. she's funny. She played with the camera. She <laughs> plays with me. She was always playful. And it's a yeah. funny anecdote also about my grandmother. I never played any game with my grandmother. Yeah. Ever. Not, we didn't play Monopoly. We didn't play cards. We didn't play anything like that. No, she would never do that. It was a waste of time for her. But she was a playful character. She played with life. She played uh, the piano, but it was a form of art when he, we needed to study and play just stupid games. That was none of her business. She always wanted to learn. She wanted to be, become a better person or she wanted to uh, be introduced to new, interesting, fascinating people, artists and everything. And we had, I think we have the same kind of personality, both of us. Oh, great. So what are you what are you working on in terms of current projects right now? I just uh, returned from the Cannes Film Festival yeah. um, just a few days ago. OK. I had the privilege of serving on the Queer Palm jury there. I actually, saw that. Congratulations. For, yes. For the anecdote. So I saw lots of films, uh, but I, I also was there with my producer um, defending my new project, which is a feature fiction film. It's a drama, it's a love story uh, between a young dancer and his choreographer uh, set in the opera world. And um, the title of my project is Orpheus, uh, referring to the Greek myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. So it's gonna be a contemporary, modern contemporary, free adaptation of this Greek myth uh, set between Switzerland and Berlin where mm. I live. That's very exciting. I cannot wait to see that. Congratulations. Hopefully, I mean, there's still a long way to go. It's a, yeah. it's a very complicated project, but uh, the first feedback is, is positive. We found a French co-producer in Cannes. Uh, we're about to sign the contract, so we're very excited. Thank you so much. The film Madame is, you know, not only an extraordinary story of your grandmother and you, and the bomb, it's such, it's such a great tribute to your grandmother as well. So congratulations on that. I, I'm so happy that we can screen it here again with the Consulate General of Switzerland, Atlanta. The film is screening um, June 14th at 7 p.m. at the Midtown Art Cinema. Uh, there's a reception at Opera Diem at six o'clock beforehand. Uh, I'm excited for people to see the film and talk about it afterwards. Stefan Wright Riethauser, thank you so much for talking to us today. I'm very, very excited about showing the film. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone, for listening and enjoy the film. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.